Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Schottlander, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our 11th annual dinner in the library. Um, speaking for the UC San Diego Library and all of its staff, let me say how very pleased and honored we are to have you join us for this very, very special evening. And we're equally pleased and honored to have with us tonight to welcome you our dynamic and visionary Chancellor Pradeep Khosla. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Chancellor Khosla. Thank you, Brian, and welcome, everybody. Before I say something, let me just say I really appreciate that very short and perfect introduction. <laughs> it only took two years, but he finally got it right. And if you wonder why he was reappointed just very recently with flying colors, you now know. So Brian, congratulations for your, on your reappointment. He, Brian has done, he has done a truly amazing job. Uh, the library, as you know, is, uh, when it was built, was supposed to be at the center of this campus, physical center of this campus. And under Brian's leadership, it has become the intellectual center of this campus, too. Uh, and this library is very important for our intellectual pursuits, for our intellectual vitality, and for everything we do. Uh, you will see that in this library, if you were to just stand outside, about 8,000 people walk through this construction, this library every day, and about 2 million people access uh, the digital archives that Brian has shown leadership for and the ones he has created. And the reason I mention this is because this campus recently went through a strategic planning exercise and part of the exercise was to think about what is it that we want to be and what is it that we are going to be. And in this complicated process, two good things happened. Number one was the whole campus came together. And if you walk around now, if you talk to people, you will see that there is some unity in our thinking. We might still differ in the approach, but there's some unity in our thinking as to what we want to be. But the other good thing that came about was, what is it that we should be doing? And one of the things that we focused on was a set of research areas. And all of these research areas have one thing in common. So these research areas range from climate change to water resources to human health to pandemics, to public health, uh, to disparities. They have one thing in common, and that is big data. And big data has one thing that is absolutely necessary, and that is curating this big data. And the world's leader in this curation is Brian Schottlander. <laughs> and so you can tell that this library is going to, has played an important role in this campus, for this campus, and going forward, it's going to play a more important role because everything we want to do revolves around building a big data infrastructure. And this big data infrastructure is going to change the way, for example, we create cures. It's going to change the way we create therapies. It's going to change the way we think about climate change. It's going to change the way we do research on water resources and the effects of ocean acidification and ocean observation on climate. And all of this data is going to be uh, located, stored right at UC San Diego. And Brian is leading the charge for curating this data, trying to develop new ways, new technologies, new processes as to how this data is going to be stored forever. So the reason I keep on repeating this is to really in, uh, emphasize how important this is for all of us. Now, having said that, there are other good things that are happening, too, besides this library. Uh, this library also was ranked the top 25 libraries in the country which is truly amazing. It is truly amazing. It talks, it, it demonstrates our investments in the library. It demonstrates Brian's leadership. And it tells you that this is one of the few places, this being UC San Diego, that can take something that did not exist one day and 10, 20, 30 years later can make it top 20, top 30 in the country. So let me give you two more examples just to emphasize this point. Kind of related to this, but not quite. So our uh, Rady School of Management and uh, SCAC School of Pharmacy are both 10 years old. And within 10 years, they're both ranked in top 10 in their specialties in the country. And the point I'm trying to make is, if you are making an investment in this place, you are making an investment in people who think about the future, in people who are entrepreneurs, in people who know how to 
win the game, quote unquote, win the game. There is no loser in this game, but in, in this case, we want to win the game. We want to be the influencers. We want to be the leaders who are telling this world what the future is going to look like in many, many areas. So thank you very much for your investments. I really, really appreciate this. And the reason I'm here today is to personally thank you. I also want to say one more thing before I get off the stage, which is UC San Diego overall is doing extremely well. So the strategic planning process led to a lot of good things. Uh, like I said, one of them was uh, unifying all of us. And in the process, we've been talking about who we are and what we want to be. And we are seeing these rankings that uh, just recently, like I think two days ago, uh, US News and World Report uh, came out with uh, national rankings where we were ranked like 37 in the country. Uh, Two years ago, we were 39. We were the number eight national uh, public university. Two years ago, we were number nine. And all of this is thanks to you and your support and the way you talk about us, the way you represent us, thanks to our faculty and the great work they do, thanks to our alumni and the great work they do. And every year, because of this great combination of uh, things that are happening around us, we get a better and better class of undergraduates. So the class coming in this year, October 1, is when they come to campus, has an average GPA of 4.11. I don't know how anybody gets above four. I barely got 3.5. So I would not be admitted to UC San Diego. And with that said, I'm really proud to be the chancellor of a campus where I would not be admitted today. So thank you very much. So how about another round of applause for the chancellor, who's already had a very long day, who's been very generous in extending his day further still. And I want to thank all of you, indeed, for joining us this evening. As Chancellor Kosla has said, we so appreciate your support and your company. Dinner in the Library is our signature fundraising event, and it gives members of our community, members like yourselves, a, a festive opportunity to join us in celebrating our love of knowledge and learning. Uh, over the last decade, and thanks to your generous support, we have succeeded in raising tens of thousands of dollars in unrestricted funds for library collections and library services, both physical and digital. I'm pleased to announce that tonight's event has raised $150,000 in sponsorships, a record amount for us. And I'm very grateful to our very generous donors and would like to acknowledge them with a round of applause. Our lead sponsor again this year is Audrey Geisel and the Dr. Seuss Fund at the San Diego Foundation. Audrey has always been extremely generous, for which I am extremely grateful. But this year, she has been more generous still, doubling her sponsorship level from last year. Regrettably, Audrey can't be with us in person tonight, but I know she is with us in spirit. Likewise, this evening's platinum level sponsors, Don and Mary Ann Lyle, are only able to be with us in spirit, but I also very much appreciate their increased support this year. Our gold level sponsors include John Barrall, Karen Dow, who chairs my advisory board, Julianne Larson and James Forbes, and our own UC San Diego Alumni Association. Our silver level sponsors include Joel and Nancy Dimsdale, Elsevier Publishing, the Evans Foundation, and Union Bank. Our bronze level sponsors are James Hall, Jeannie Jones and Don Breitenberg, and EBSCO Information Services. And our copper level sponsors are Standish and Teresa Fleming, Ann Otterson, and United Capital. Please join me in a big round of applause for their generosity and their continued support. We have some very special friends with us tonight that I'd like to acknowledge next. Uh, these include a man I like to call Boss, um, our Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Suresh Subramani, along with a number of other members of the campus senior leadership, including Armin Afsahi, our Associate Vice Chancellor for Advancement and Chief Alumni Officer, Kim Barrett, our Dean of Graduate Studies, 
and Barbara Sari, our Associate Vice Chancellor and Dean of Undergraduate Education. Thank you all for being with us tonight. And finally, lest any of you think that events like this simply spring from my head, <laughs> like Athena sprang from the head of Zeus, let me assure you that they do not. Um, instead, they are the result of the hard work and high energy of dedicated volunteers and staff, a few of whom I would like especially to recognize. Sabrina Martucci Johnson led a fabulous group of silent auction volunteers who included Karen Dow, Linda Galtier, and Gordon Stanley. They were aided and abetted by a fantastic group of staff who attended to more details than you can imagine, including Taylor Hagland, Barbara Brink, Christina Continelli, Patty Van Zeiss, and Doug Jackson. Please join me in thanking all of them with a big round of applause. This seems like an opportune time to introduce my new Director of Development, Julie Sully. If you haven't met her already, I know she's looking forward to the opportunity in the days ahead. Julie joins us from our sister campus to the north, UC Irvine, where for more than a decade she was part of their library development team. Julie, will you stand? I'm so, so pleased to have her as part of our team at UC San Diego now. So before I leave you to enjoy your meal, let me further whet your appetite, as it were, by announcing a few of tonight's auction winners. John Thompson, the winner of the Treasures of Special Collections. Alice Kulikovsky, the winner of Treasures of Special Collections. <laughs> and Mark Johnson, the winner of the Big Apple Getaway. So um, it's a real pleasure tonight to see so many new faces in the room and in the library. And for the benefit of those of you who are new to the library, I, I want to be sure that you will have taken note of the doors as you came in our front entrance. Um, these doors were created by the artist John Baldessari as part of the campus's uh, very prestigious and quite unusual in this country, um, Stewart Art Collection, a public collection of sculpture. Um, let me give you a little background about the doors themselves. So John Baldessari is an internationally renowned conceptual artist, an influential teacher, who over a 30-year career on the faculty here at UCLA and at CalArts um, has encouraged his students to think outside of the box and to break the rules. So for the Geisel Library installation, um, Baldessari took our prominent entrance and replaced a lot of the glass, the plain old clear glass that had been there for years with panels of colored glass in some instances, and panels with silk-screened photographic images of UCSD students on them. Students standing on top of shelved books. And above them, he placed four words, read, write, think, dream. And he did this because his advice to his students throughout the years had been that they remember that beyond the day-to-day -day grind, comes the chance to contemplate the unexpected and to envision the new. He thought that's what UCSD was about, and I think he was right. Now, there is someone with us tonight who has a healthy appreciation of both the unexpected and the new, and that is this year's Geisel Citation Awardee. The Geisel Citation, and that for 2014 is to my right, uh, for library philanthropy is named perhaps obviously enough, for our most generous benefactor, Audrey Geisel. I'm very pleased that this year's recipient is Dorothy Greger, who was the university librarian at both UC San Diego and following that at our sister campus, UC Berkeley. Uh, Dorothy is here with us tonight, and I would like to invite her up to the podium with me. Thanks. 
Dorothy served as our university librarian from 1985 uh, to 1992, um, a formative period in the university's history and a formative period in the library's growth and success. She led this library through major transformations, both conceptual and physical. In fact, she presided over the underground expansion in which you are now all sitting <laughs> of the Geisel Library building and has since then continued to provide invaluable support to the library and to me. The Geisel citation to my right reads, Dorothy Greger has played an integral role in the growth and success of the UC San Diego Library. As university librarian from 1985 to 1992, Dorothy led the library through a period of great change, overseeing the underground addition to the iconic Geisel Library building. Since then, she has continued to provide valuable assistance, including establishing the Dorothy Greger Endowment for general support of the library's distinguished collections. Dorothy's thoughtful patronage serves as an inspiration to others who understand the importance of academic research libraries in the pursuit of transformational discovery and knowledge. Please join me in congratulating Dorothy on this well-deserved citation. Brian said I could have three or four sentences. <laughs> so I'll use them to tell you how happy I am to be back in my favorite library and to be sharing dinner in the library with all of you. I think it's the case then in any work environment, it's really the people that make the difference. And I was blessed with an exceptionally competent and caring staff and the best boss I ever had, Dr. Harold Tico. And I guess one of the reasons I did the collection endowment is just to maintain the connection with the place that I'm really very, very fond of. And I made it so that the university librarian had discretion over spending the funds, because that's exactly what I would have wanted if I had been here. <laughs> and my last sentence is, my thanks to all of you for your support of the UCSD library. Thank you. No, you don't have to carry it. Okay. <laughs> um, th those of you who have joined us before know that um, I'm in the habit of um, presenting a book to the library in honor of our guest, and tonight is no exception. So uh, when I do this, I usually have a conversation with uh, the individual to get a sense of what, what book she or he might be interested in um, and might think appropriate for the library. Um, and this evening, I'm pleased to present a 20 pound book. <laughs> I think it's the biggest one I've ever presented. <laughs> the book Roads of Arabia, Archaeology and History of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, published in 2010 by Samaji Art Publishers in Paris. Now the story behind this is this is the exhibition catalog um, for an exhibition about the treasures of Saudi Arabia that is coming to Northern California. Um, for which Dorothy is going to be one of the uh, docents. Right. And uh, so it's my great, great pleasure to present this to the library in honor of Dorothy Gray. Thank you. Now, before I introduce the evening's speaker, Noel Riley Fitch, um, let me tell you briefly uh, about a few things going on in the library. This has been a real banner year for us in many ways. Um, after years of consolidations and restructuring, we have been enjoying, and I do mean enjoying, a sort of rebirth. Uh, building a new organizational structure can, and I don't think I need to tell many of you this, be both challenging and exhilarating. Um, I prefer the exhilarating part um, because it is associated with growth on the one hand and really satisfyingly the ability on the other to hire new librarians, which we are finally again doing. These new colleagues are helping us to build exciting and cutting edge programs like digital archiving, like research data curation, like scholarly communications, which are essential to supporting the modern research university. 
This past year, we were honored to have materials from our amazing Hill Collection of Pacific Voyages included in the San Diego Museum of Natural History's exhibition, Real Pirates, which has just come down uh, in the last few weeks. It's this collaboration with the Natural History Museum that is the very sort of community partnership that we hope to do more of in the coming years. When it comes to rare and valuable materials, moreover, we've had, again, an outstanding year. This past winter, we were given a very special birthday present for Dr. Seuss's birthday by Audrey Geisel herself, who donated to us uh, from Dr. Seuss's personal collection 1,500 new items, including sketches, manuscript drafts, photographs, and more. Um, and we will be selectively exhibiting these in the years to come. Uh, thank you. Um, as many of you know, also, the library is home to the papers of some of the world's most prominent and influential scientists. This spring, our Mandeville Special Collections became the official repository for the papers of Dr. Jonas Salk. We're thrilled to add the Salk paper papers to our collections of other scientific materials, and again, are planning an exhibition of these materials later this year, specifically in honor of the Jonas Salk centenary. We continue to acquire other new archival materials, and as our funding allows, are digitizing these in order to make them available to a much larger audience. For example, we received a grant from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission to digitize the papers of physicist Leo Szilard, who many consider the father of the atomic bomb, but which in any event document the birth of the nuclear age. The library also acquired this year its first all-digital archive, a significant collection that documents the activities of Cesar Chavez and the National Farm Workers Movement. I fully expect that we will be acquiring more and more born digital archives in the future. And we're continuing to build out the library's San Diego Technology Archive, an online initiative to document the history, development, and growth of the companies and entrepreneurial individuals that make up San Diego's technology community. This year, we added a number of important oral histories of individuals in our area, including those of Neil Centuria, uh, Stan Fleming, who is with us tonight, and Mary Walshock, our speaker at dinner in the library a couple of years ago. As you can see, we've been busy, we've been having fun, and we're looking forward to doing more of it. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker and our feature for the evening. For anyone who loves Paris, and who doesn't, literary history lingering indulgently in iconic European cafes, Noelle Riley Fitch needs no introduction. She has chronicled the lives of some of the most fascinating cultural icons, from culinary queens like Julia Child, to literary pioneers like Sylvia Beach, to bohemian cult figures like Anais Nin. She is an internationally acclaimed biographer and the author of Julia Child's only authorized biography, entitled Appetite for Life. Now, we all know, I suspect, about Julia's culinary training and her many, many accomplishments in the realm of French cooking. Noelle, however, delves behind that glittering surface to uncover the real woman, her thoughts, and her passions. In addition to her award-winning books, which have been translated into more than a dozen languages, Noelle has written broadly on topics such as European travel, literary life, and cultural history. Please join me in a big welcome for Noelle Riley Fitch. Bon appétit, everyone. Bon appétit. <laughs> That's Julia Child's signature exit line. <laughs> Signing off each of her t about 250 WGBH programs 
as the French chef. And we know, I think, that Julia was not French, nor was she, did she ever claim to be, uh, she was not French and she never claimed to be a chef. It was her producer who chose the title because it fit into the narrow columns of the TV guide. <laughs> Julia Child was a TV personality. Um, Dick Cavett called her a media animal. And she was an assiduous, almost scientific researcher in matters culinary and a cultural icon who, in her very American way, led the long overdue acceptance of women as a force in the patriarchal culinary world. US News and World Report in 1997, when she was, I think, 85 years old, compared her pioneering work in the culinary world with the king, Elvis Presley, and the queen, Alfred Kinsey. <laughs> I called my book uh, the only biography authorized by Julia herself, Appetite for Life, because I wanted to evoke her signature sign off, thank you, Albert, and her voice and her zest for living, which, uh, like few other people I have ever met, I experienced directly during the two decades of our acquaintance and then friendship. How rare and pleasurable it is, she said, she wrote to me, to remain friends with one's biographer after the book appears. <laughs> and our frequent visits to her at Casa Duringa in Montecito, her last home, uh, over the years really confirmed that friendship. I came to know Julia during the last two decades of her life as a dining companion, of course, <laughs> or should I say many courses. I wanted to write um, an historical biography, uh, not just a food book. And in a, in a way, then I knew her as um, in a documentary way, as well as, as a, uh, a friend. She was really a friend of my husband's. She loved men. <laughs> so at her, at her insistence, I went through every drawer and cupboard and filing cabinet in her four-story house, if you call the basement one floor. Uh, I read all of her letters and Paul's letters. I read their diaries. And then I interviewed about 600 of her family, friend, friends, and colleagues. I began my serious work about 1991 after Having read my Sylvia Beach book about her beloved Paris, she agreed to give me exclusivity, uh, stating clearly that she was far too busy a woman to sit through any extensive interviews. Of course, she knew I'd never done any living subject, so she knew I knew how to do my research. Nevertheless, I visited often in her Irving Street home in Cambridge, where she cooked uh, working lunches for us. And she joined me and my husband, whatever city we happened to, to be in, uh, coincidentally. Well, she loved to sit with him because he spoke French to her. Um, so we met for many uh, restaurant outings, of which more uh, in a moment. I had a sort of symbiotic relationship with her life for eight years, as any biographer would tell you. I mean, I was her designated and exclusive biographer, which meant that I had to try to empathize with her, to get inside her skin, 
on the one hand, and on the other hand, to remain um, an objective biographer, historian, psychologist, novelist, sleuth, all those roles that biographers play. Um, it's much more, it's a, it's a balance that biographers always deal with, but it's much keener when you know the person that you're writing about, that you're in, you're probing. <laughs> Um, so I had to let all that information that I gathered um, sort of steep like a tea bag, um, or more, more appropriately, like an olive in a martini, <laughs> inside my mind. And to treat her as, uh, to, to to treat this book, this project, as a literary historical biography, much as I would write about Teddy Roosevelt or Amelia Earhart. So I pose the question continually, um, why did Julia matter? And how much did she matter? And how was she shaped by historical events? And how did she, in turn, shape the era and history that she lived through? Her, affilia her affiliation with WGBH, PBS, Boston, her uh, gift, initially her gift of papers to Radcliffe College Library and her honorary degree from Harvard, long marked her as a New England Yankee. But my book attempts to correct this major distortion of the real Julia, who was born in Pasadena in August 1912, amid orange groves, uh, big blue sky, and sun. Her privileged upbringing with country clubs, and that's plural, they belonged in those days to several country clubs, um, sports, she skied Tahoe. She swam in their summer home in Saint Malo, north of here. Um, her private girls' school, they all made her a social animal. It gave her leadership skills. So did being six feet two inches tall. She was a ringleader, life of the party, initiator of pranks, full steam ahead. Let's have another adventure. In short, well, she was six two. Um, a California girl, freckle-faced, enthusiastic, optimistic, democratic, with a small d and later a large d. Um, energetic, our hometown girl, Julia McWilliams, whose life after a good education at Smith College, her mother's alma mater in Northampton, Massachusetts, would follow a predictable pattern. But World War II interrupted. Her country club coterie had volunteered for service. Most of the guys went in the Navy. And Julia signed up with the OSS. She just flew on her own to Washington and got the best job she could. So she was working for the OSS, the, our, secret, our first secret intelligence service at the time. It didn't morph into the CIA until after the war. And then she volunteered for service overseas. She thought that would be a great adventure. Julia wasn't a spy for the OSS, but she was head of registry. She was, as she liked to, to uh, downplay it, um, she was a file clerk which made her privy to all the information that went back and forth from the field to uh, Washington. But what's important is she learned other skills. She learned to be organized. If you're a file clerk, you need that. <laughs> Rational and disciplined, all the traits that would enable her later to research into culinary techniques that made mastering the art of French cooking uh, real science. 
And she was posted to Ceylon, Sri Lanka, where she met the love of her life, Paul Child, who was 10 years her senior, probably a foot shorter, who was to become her skillful mentor in matters of sex and food. Toward the end of the Asian conflict, they were transferred to China, where restaurants began, where we got one of the great culinary uh, cuisines. There, the OSS colleagues, as they had been in India, were very well-educated. Many had advanced degrees and had been professors. Um, they were also well-traveled. And so they would seek out the family dining restaurants, I guess they would have called them, in the countryside. And they would talk about the food that they were eating and about the, how it was prepared, um, the great meals they'd already had, the last time they were in Paris, what they ate. And this, Joey had never been around people like this before. This was a new experience um, to talk about food, how food was prepared. She was always hungry, you can imagine, at 6'2". Um, but she never really cared about how the food got on the plate, just that there was lots of it. In fact, her only food memories for me, to, to, when she was talking to me, were the deep fried codfish balls smothered in egg glop that her mother made on Sunday mornings when the cook was off. <laughs> and she remembers the jelly donuts that she bought across the street uh, from her dorm at Smith College. Back home, while Julia was being excited by the idea of food and a new kind of food, her country was being commercialized by Heinz, Borden, Armour, and Swift. <laughs> they were stuffing and gelatinizing each dish. And a lot of us in the room remember this. It was called the golden age of food processing, the golden age of American chemistry. See, we, we sort of worshiped science then. And it just happened that women were trying to get out of the house at that very time. So thanks to technology, what was advertised, what was popular, were things like um, heat and serve, jiffy mix, the 10-minute meal, quick and easy, the can over cookbook. That's the cookbook that sold more than, than any other. It was written by Poppy Cannon, who was um, the editor of House Beautiful and then Ladies' Home Journal, or as Ezra Pound liked to call it, call it Ladies' Home Urinal. <laughs> and she appeared on CBS every week. Um, she's been called, rightfully so, the queen of molded jello frozen food and canned soup. But Paul was interested in food, and Julia in Paul. So her work in Kangming, China, really awakened her taste buds and her desires. The storms of war aroused her, also her really gutsy endurance. They were surviving leeches and dysentery and a plague that saw hundreds of bodies floating down the river. It was right at the end of the war. Um, Julia's attitude was always, push on ahead. What do we do tomorrow? Um, live now. For her, carpe diem meant seize the day, not the fish of the day. That fish was all solo mio. <laughs> it was providential that Paul's post-war posting was to Paris. So Julie had her first real French meal in Rouen on their way to Paris. It was November 1948. 
A meal she said that she told me it made her hysterical for a month. You know, oysters on the half, sh half shell, a, bo a chilled bottle of, of Pui Fouze and Sol Meunier and s buttered with hot Normandy butter and a green salad, creme fraiche, coffee. I mean, Paul was familiar with that, what we call the French dining experience. Julia could barely cook. She tried to take lessons, but she depended on house beautiful recipes. But this was Paris. So for Paul, she needed to learn to cook and to perfect her schoolgirl French, the language of gastronomy. So she enrolled in that center of French patriarchal cookery, the Cordon Bleu School where she slowly and painfully, amid much sexist derision, learned the codified rules of historical cuisine. Gradually, her omelets stopped running and took shape. Her bernaise did not congeal. Her butter did not blacken. And Paul was happy. And Julia was on her way to discovering her true vocation. So at 38, she discovered France and its cuisine. At 49, she published her Mastering the Art of French Cooking. It was a slow and arduous 10 years she, in collaboration with two French women. Typing, even when Paul was transferred to Marseille and then Bonn and then Oslo. She, she kept this research, experimentation, typing uh, going. It was a long, long process. But that book and her TV program, which came out of just an interview about the book in Boston at WGBH, really were transformative. This was what was going on in this country at the same time was the Betty Friedan feminine mystique period, which I was all for, of course. The throw the marshmallows in the jello and get out of the kitchen era. The men can cook, but only beside the, the barbecue stove in the backyard era. So her book really was and the reason it was turned down by so many publishers, it was just contrary to what was going on at the time. So it was truly revolutionary that it, caught, that it caught on. And I think the pursuit of pleasure and good food was really a hard sell in um, this puritanical society. But it, it really helped that our teacher was amusing. She was very funny. And also, she was non-threatening. I mean, here's our Dionysian spirit housed in the body of a woman that looks like our high school gym teacher. <laughs> Her French chef program slowly spread across the country, and her fame grew. Um, and three national magazines put her on the cover. The symbol of gustatory pleasure that was Newsweek, Our Lady of the Ladle, <laughs> Time. She invented modern life, US News and World Report. But historically speaking, she really was revolutionary. She led a revolution in the way we cook and we grow and cook and think about food. And that last one is, I think, the important factor. Mastering the Art of French Cooking and Julia's The French Chef came out at just the right time, Thinking, speaking of the historical context. One, um, the Kennedy's Francophile Camelot made everything French respectively chic. It was Julia that made it accessible. Um, Second, the growth of television, especially PBS and the cult of TV celebrity culture. It allowed Julia to become a household name. Uh, Ch Chuck Williams told me that every day 
the day after a Julia Child program appeared on TV, that Williams Sonoma would sell out any instrument that she used in her preparation. And finally, I think it was the, the unprecedented prosperity that led to the marketplace responsiveness to her calls for quality and integrity of produce, and above all, her call to her obvious enjoyment of the pleasures of the table. Um, when you think about it, we no longer go to the store and find one lettuce, iceberg, um, one mushroom, the white button, or one herb, parsley. I remember that. And food writers no longer have to define quiche <laughs> or spell it or say quiche, not quickie. <laughs> That was a Bill Clinton joke. <laughs> today, today, we demand and get the best produce. Every town's got a farmer's market. We eat out frequently. We read dozens of food-related magazines and books. And at the turn of the Julia century, cooking schools were growing like yeast, and there were about seven jobs waiting for each graduate. Um, but it's our attitude toward cooking and eating that has changed. We now know that food and cooking are essential in the study of history and culture. Harvard, Harvard acknowledged this revolution when it gave her the honorary doctorate. Students were wildly happy about that. A 1996 Emmy was followed by the French Legion of Honor in 2000. To dine with Julia, as my husband and I did so frequently, was to talk politics. She had very strong opinions. And there was a lot of humor. She liked dirty jokes. Um, and uh, we also learned to the extent to which her TV persona had become her real self. One night, um, we settled at a table at Lydia Shire's um, Four Seasons in Boston. And the eager young waiter approached with a small plate in hand, ready for his moment on the stage with Julia. And he said, he announced proudly that the square yellow item on the plate was butter and that the triangular yellow item was margarine. And uh, his first line delivered, he began to exit stage right. And Julia called out, young man, please remove the margarine from the table. <laughs> she had, uh, maybe she threw in an adjective, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but she did finish with, uh, we prefer rich creamery butter. Those three words always went together. <laughs> I remember the young would-be actor working as a server, leaving the stage crestfallen. <laughs> now we know that he learned his lesson of eating whole, real food. I want to encapsulate as fast as I can uh, the philosophy of, of our first lady of the American kitchen and table, as Greg Claiborne called her. One, cooking and eating are fun, a source of health and pleasure, and by gum, pleasure is your inalienable right. Don't be afraid of any food, especially fat. <laughs> and now studies are telling us the same thing. Eat in moderation. Eat all good, nutritious food in moderation. Four, cooking is an art just like painting and ballet and music, and it should be taken seriously and taught in our universities. Five, cooking is a career, but it's accessible to anyone, men, women, and children, who seek its pleasures and rewards. And six, cooking and dining, this is very important to her. Cooking and dining, food and wine, 
are communal rituals that convey love and harmony and bring happiness. So we cook together and we dine together as we did this evening. But this brings me back to Paul Child, who died in 1994, about a decade before she did. My book, Appetite for Life, is above all a great love story. Paul not only reinforced the discipline and technical precision that enabled her to realize her career, but he also encouraged and assisted her in the study. Um, when she first went out and, and did cooking demonstrations, he would, he would wash her pots and pans in the men's room before they left. And of course, when she was doing volume two of Mastering the Art of French Cooking, he spent hundreds of hours working with her to try to get just the right French bread uh, for that book. I'll end on that note with a poem by Paul that illustrates the association of love, passion, and food. Here is the poem. Julia, Julia, cook and nifty wench, whose unsurpassed canals and hot souffles, whose English, Norse, and German, and whose French are all beyond my piteous powers to praise, whose sweetly rounded bottom and whose legs, whose gracious face, whose nature temperate, are only equaled by her scrambled eggs. <laughs> Except for me, your ever-loving mate, this acclamation shaped in 14 lines, whose inner truth belies its outer sight. For never were there foods, nor were there wines, whose flavor equals yours for sheer delight. Oh, luscious dish. Oh, gustatory pleasure, you satisfy my taste buds beyond measure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, how about another round of applause for Noel? <clears throat> um, again, to, to mark our event tonight and, and in Noel's honor, um, I had a little conversation with Noel about a book that she would like to have added to our collection. And I'm very pleased to make a personal gift um, on her recommendation and, and in her honor of, of this book entitled, When Paris Went Dark, The City of Light Under German Occupation, 1940 to 1944, published just this year by Little Brown and Company. And Noel, I'm so pleased to be adding this to our collection in your name. Thank you again. And so, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening as much as I have. Uh, before you go, uh, let me tell you that we do have some keepsakes for you to take with you tonight, including a copy of Noel's biography of Julia Child, along with a copy of the hot off the presses fall issue of the university's Triton magazine, overseen by my friend Armin Afsahi, uh, <laughs> whose cover article just happens to feature an article on how libraries like ours are handling the transition to a digital world. Let me also give you a sneak peek of next year's dinner in the library. The 2015 dinner will be held on Friday, September the 18th, and I'm very happy that my good friend, Dr. Sarah Thomas, the Vice President for Libraries at Harvard, has agreed to be our keynote speaker. Prior to taking the helm at Harvard last year, Dr. Thomas served for six years as the first American and the first woman dean of libraries in the history of Oxford University. And I encourage you to look forward to a, an evening of really delightful storytelling about that experience. For those of you who have won auction items, your names will be on the whiteboard uh, in the auction area as you exit the building. Staff will be there to assist you with those items. 
Um, and once again, on behalf of the library, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening and for your support. I look forward to seeing you in a year's time. Good night and safe travels. <laughs>